So we will start with this very spontaneous discussion, which, with, which we just planned a couple of days ago, but nevertheless a very timely one. And we title it more or less in accordance with the article that we are going to discuss today, the article by Bruno Masayes. I'm very glad to welcome you at our IAP talk. And so the article's title is The Attack of the Civilization State. And our title, in addition to that, um, is uh, Towards One World or Conflict Among Civilizations? Question mark. And so this article by Bruno Masayes was released almost a year ago, but um, it, I would say, even has gained even more in relevance uh, nowadays when we look uh, especially at the rising continent, as we like to call it these days, um, Asia. And so uh, Mr. Masayesh and Hannes Svoboda uh, will discuss uh, this article, will maybe argue a bit about it, and then we'll help, we hopefully will make some conclusions for ourselves, uh, what it means basically for the world, for the changing global order, and maybe a little bit of the background. The IEP actually has been focusing on Asia more and more um, uh, this year and previous year, and so we've already held a couple discussions on India, Pakistan relations, on China very recently. Uh, and so this article will also hopefully help us to, uh, you know, have a bit more philosophical perspectives on, on things. And um, so without further ado, I would just introduce our guest speaker, uh, Bruno Massage, the senior advisor at Flint Global in London. He's also a senior fellow at, at Renmin University in Beijing and Hudson Institute in Washington. Uh, he was the Portuguese Europe Minister from 2013 until 2015, and he received his doctorate in political science from Harvard University and was a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington and the Carnegie Institute in Brussels. He has also written extensively for many um, uh, publishing houses and uh, media, such as Financial Times, Political, The, Guardians, the Guardian, and uh, also authored a couple of books uh, on China, on Eurasia, and on the United States. So, Mr. Masayesh, if you can maybe, um, you know, at first give a little bit of an introduction, what, what do you mean by a civilization state in this article that we're discussing today? Right. Well, very glad to be here. It's a, a pleasure to join you. Um, well, you said the article was published a year ago. It was actually written two years ago, it took one year to publish because it was a new magazine that was being launched and they asked me to delay. But I'm very comfortable about this one because I think it's not going to go out of date for a long time. Um, I was trying in the article to describe some uh, long-term trends that I see happening. Uh, and they, uh, uh, they, they come down to very simple ideas, uh, but ideas that I've been thinking about for a long time. The first idea is this moment of universalism that, that we've had. And sometimes you talk about a moment of universalism going back to 1989, but in fact, of course, this is uh, uh, reductive. Uh, we've had a moment of universalism for uh, two, three, four centuries of Western universalism. The conviction, very strong conviction that Western societies had found or were on the way of founding the best and definitive truth about how to organize societies. So the idea of the end of history is not Fukuyama's idea, it's an idea that you find very easily reading the great philosophers of the Western tradition, John Locke, even Thomas Hobbes. What they're talking about is, here's the political truth, we still have to implement it, it will take a while to implement it, once it's implemented, it's going to be so attractive that it will soon become universal, and there will be not a lot more to do in terms of looking for the best way to organize our societies. So I, I've become convinced, and I try to argue that in the book, that a lot of this conviction was um, derived from, not from a theoretical fact, but from the practical fact that Western societies, because they were first to develop modern technology, were in a position of power, to, in fact, take their ideas worldwide and impose them worldwide. What we've had in recent decades and recent years is, of course, a process of catching up, which has become so dramatic uh, that it is now impossible for Western societies to e exert the same kind of power. And I suspect that ideas follow power to a considerable extent, and therefore our ability to impose our ideas on the rest of the world is also 
disappearing, eroding, uh, and that's becoming more and more obvious each year. We just had a spectacular example of that in Alaska when uh, Yang Jichi uh, met uh, Anthony Blinken and uh, uh, to some surprise from the American side, I believe, and it's obvious from the body language, uh, and to some surprise worldwide, as you see foreign ministers commenting on what happened, um, Yang Jishi uh, proceeded to lecture Blinken for 27 minutes about how the United States should solve its problems. And we've been so used to seeing the opposite happen that it was kind of an interesting moment. Uh, so uh, it is revealing of a moment when different uh, powers um, are increasingly convinced that they have their own way of organizing their societies. Um, and this is not limited to authoritarian regimes. I think that's interesting and important to point out because you could say, well, an authoritarian regime obviously can never accept a Western democracy. It's not in the interest of the political elites and the economic elites to accept that. But I'd like to bring up uh, India into this discussion. And I do that in my piece more than China, actually. And that's deliberate because it's a way of, of arguing, no, this is not strictly a question about democracy and authoritarianism. We have in, in India a democracy, a vibrant democracy. And we have uh, all over Asia democracies that are, I think, working better than many Western democracies. And they are also looking for their own special path. That's very obvious in India, where the debate, perhaps one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting debates happening in the world today is, well, what is the relation between the Indian tradition, which one could call the, the Hindu tradition, but that's, it's a, uh, this is subtler that it sounds at first. And, and Hinduism is not necessarily understood as, um, uh, as, as a religion. And some of the founders of the Hindutva moment, uh, movement uh, argue that um, Emperor Akbar was a Hindu. Well, he was, from a religious point of view, a Muslim. But from a cultural, civilizational point of view, he had embraced the Indian way of life, so to speak, um, and abandoned the Persianate uh, ideas that, that, that were uh, in vogue before. And therefore, it deserved to be called a Hindu. So when we say the Indian or Hindu tradition, this shouldn't be necessarily understood as a religious question, which then brings up the question of uh, secularism. But it's a cultural question. And the question that many politicians and thinkers in India today ask, and I'll, I'll stop with this, I find it the most striking way to introduce us to the idea of a civilization state is, well, why should the Hindu tradition be understood against the background and within the framework of liberalism? How do we fit the Hindu tradition within liberalism? How do we find place for it to, 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 to be alive within liberalism? Why is this the question and not the other way around? Why don't we find a place for liberalism within the Hindu tradition? And many people in India would point out and point out all the time, well, this Hindu tradition is arguably thousands of years old. Uh, going back to the Vedas, we don't quite know when, when, when they were written. Uh, thousands of years ago, certainly. And liberalism is perhaps 300 years old. Why should the Hindu tradition be interpreted and understood within the framework of liberalism and not the other way around? And then the second question is, well, if we recognize some kind of primacy for, for the Hindu tradition and not for liberalism, then that must involve also organizing the state uh, around this tradition and not around liberalism. So the state uh, can represent different civilizations. And one of them is liberalism. Um, that's still the dominant tradition in Europe. But in India, it isn't, uh, many would argue. And liberalism does not have any special claim to being universal anymore. Well, it has a claim if it's justified as another issue. But if, if I may interrupt, um, let's, right. let's go to, to India. And I, I thank you very much also for, for raising the Indian case, because we should not always uh, presuppose that uh, Asia is China and only China. 
Um, yes, uh, but what is the Indian civilization? If you look, uh, you mentioned singular persons about the Muslims, but if you look to the real representative of Hinduism now, uh, the prime minister, he is more or less uh, trying, in some elements at least, or as discrimination against uh, the Muslims. What about the the the, not, the, the very poor uh, caste, uh, the lower caste, are the part of the Hindu uh, society and civilization? Um, so my question to you is: Is civilization, and I see your your arguments, and there are many reasons to support the arguments, but at the end of the day. Are civilizations really uh, a concept which is uh, comprising all different parts of the society, different religions, different castes? Isn't that in a way um, consolation or let's say an argument for some of the polit political class who is ruling uh, to, to reject any kind of criticism of the system and say, well, that's different. We have our own civilization. You cannot criticize that. So my, my question to you is a bit to go into the expression and definition of civilization a bit more in view of the differences which you elaborated yourself. Right. So th there is that argument that um, those speaking in the name of civilizations are in fact using a kind of false consciousness they are trying to appeal to the most to, to, to the lowest common denominator in their societies they are trying to appeal to emotions and political passion at a very basic level and they are doing this in a self-interest way uh, this is an argument that comes very easily to us um, but uh, i don't think in the end it is a very powerful argument um, because uh, Again, one has to recognize the fact that these cultures are ancient. They have produced uh, uh, extraordinary documents of political, social, cultural reflection. This is not only a political fraud that is perpetrated by elites uh, in order to remain in power. Uh, and we shouldn't be we, we, we shouldn't be so presumptions as, as to think that. And so I'm always careful to try to look at things from the perspective of some of these cultures. Uh, and the second argument is, well, all this would be true if one could sustain the claim that there is something special about liberalism. If one could sustain the claim that in a liberal society, all other cultures can exist, can coexist, and can express themselves to the fullest expression, which was always the argument that the great liberal thinkers um, attempted to make. If, if we could still defend this and believe in this, then yes, then we would be able as liberals to claim a special status for liberalism. And we would be comfortable about the fact of cultural diversity because we would know that that cultural diversity could survive in a liberal society. Now, again, I don't think the question is closed and I'm more raising problems than answering them. Uh, but uh, I do think it, it, it is a difficult case to make. It is a difficult case to make that in a liberal society, you can be everything. And in Europe today, we're seeing uh, how that idea is in crisis. Uh, well, what's happening in France and, and, and the question of Islam in France, we see in fact that there is a tension and that it's not easy to reconcile. Um, and the arguments that come from the French establishment are extraordinarily naive, and I just cannot follow them. They are arguments that some concept of secularism that includes, for example, uh, forbidding people from um, uh, wearing the veil in public, uh, that this is entirely compatible with uh, freedom to, to be a Muslim. Well, it isn't. Um, it may be compatible with the freedom to be a Christian because uh, Christian tradition has been transformed uh, by liberalism in a way that made it compatible. Uh, but something has been lost. I think uh, Christians with an understanding of history know that something has been lost in the process by which uh, uh, Christianity adapted to, to liberalism. Uh, and then the pretense that liberal societies can be neutral 
also seems to me very difficult to sustain. Because in the end, you get involved, embroiled in all these kinds of problems for which there is no solution. When do you have, where are the working days? Uh, so Sunday is not a working day, uh, but Friday is a working day. I just came from Dubai. Well, in Dubai, uh, Sunday is a working day and Friday, the weekend is Friday and Saturday. And in France, if the weekend is Saturday and Sunday, then well, explain to me how this is perfectly neutral. Uh, why is the French state uh, providing a lot of funds for reconstructing churches, public funds, and why is it making it so difficult to build a new mosque? So we, I think this debate about the civilizational state comes out of a certain crisis of liberalism, which is something I relate very much to because these were the things I used to study when I was studying political philosophy, uh, the debate about roles and whether one can actually create a liberalism that is neutral between different cultures. And I came out of that discussion with very few doubts that that can't be done. Now, one can argue that liberalism is superior. According to which criterion? Well, for example, openness of mind, freedom of thought, I think this is a very high value. Uh, and then we can discuss whether the Hindu tradition or liberalism is more receptive to freedom of thought and to free thinking. But I think it's an open question. It's not clear to me that liberalism is. I, I have to look very careful. I think it's going to be a close competition. But we can then discuss which one is superior. But what I don't think we can argue is that there isn't any discussion whatsoever because liberalism exists at a different level, at a kind of a different um, structural level because liberalism is neutral, because liberalism can accommodate Hinduism and Hinduism cannot accommodate liberalism and Hinduism is not neutral. So the argument that liberals use is the argument that there isn't even a direct competition between these sets of ideas because liberalism exists at a higher level of abstraction. The critical idea of the civilizational state is to oppose this and to say, liberalism may actually be the best way to organize our societies, but it exists at the same level as other models. And some of them are being developed as we speak. Uh, and once we put them at, at the same level, then there are different civilizations. And the argument that liberalism was making is there are no different civilizations. Liberalism is not a civilization, is a kind of abstract theory. And um, all the other cultural forms can exist within liberalism. Well, I, I could, before Maria can come in, I could agree with you that this arrogance often connected with liberalism, we, we know the best way for everybody, that uh, that should be you know, left behind in, in, in the closet, in the cupboard, wherever. Now, um, you have also been a politician and you have a political thought, of course. Um, let's speak, for example, about uh, coming back to China now on, on Hong Kong. Hong Kong, uh, uh, liberalism, not democracy, liberalism was brought together with colonialism by, by the British to Hong Kong. Now there are young um, parts of the society who are fighting for democratic rules and whatever which anyway came only after the agreement between Britain and China, because under British rules, there was not a real democracy. How should the West or the Europe react? Should they say, well, that's a Chinese business, it's not our business to care? Should we, even if we are not arrogant, say, well, we should support uh, people because the Chinese should accept that there are some liberal activities or democratic activity. The same can be sp spoken about, uh, of course, India, when we speak about the, the lower caste system. How, how can we combine this yeah. kind of, let's say, more acceptance of other civilization with uh, some convictions we have that certain elements of democracy, equality, would be helpful for the society and for the world as a whole? Well, that's, that's really something I have been thinking about for a few months and I'm very concerned with. Uh, so if you do have this intellectual view that the world is uh, plural, there are different ways to organize society, and that is a, a form of wealth and richness um, that one should accept, and perhaps even embrace. And I am, as you can tell after these 10 minutes, I am very uh, sympathetic to that view. 
does that mean that we cannot speak about what happens in other societies and that we have to keep silent? And I don't want to reach that conclusion, exactly as you put it. So how do we develop arguments that are compatible with this kind of cultural pluralism without thereby being silenced and um, indifferent to what happens outside our borders? I think there are arguments and I wish one could do some work of developing them. And I wish politicians also try to develop uh, subtler and more effective arguments. I don't particularly like the argument, which is the most common one, that uh, we know what is right and we will apply it and implement it worldwide. And one of the reasons I don't like this is that it will, it's not just that it seems to me insufficient and arrogant, but I think it will be quite counterproductive and will end up exposing our weakness in ways that, that are dangerous. Uh, as, as, as we keep uh, uh, telling other societies what to do, and as our power to impose those views erodes more and more, um, that weakness will be exposed uh, with perhaps unpredictable consequences. So I would prefer other kinds of arguments. And let me give some examples of things I've been thinking about and that I would try to use if I were still a politician. Uh, so in the case of Hong, Kong, of Hong Kong, there is an agreement that was signed. And in this case, I think you can use that agreement to say that China has to respect it. Um, uh, in the case of Xinjiang, uh, one can say that Europe uh, has uh, a history that is formative for us um, and that uh, the European project is committed to preventing a repetition of what happened in Europe uh, anywhere else. Uh, and that our public opinion, and we are democracies and our public opinion demands that we have a position on this it being a question of uh, direct importance to us. Uh, but again, it's not how China should do things. It's about, well, this is important to us. And you may disagree, but you're not going to change our view on that. Um, and finally, for example, if you're dealing with a dictator, I think there's an argument that I find very powerful that, well, if you're dealing with a dictator, you cannot deal with a dictator in the same way that you deal with a democracy. Uh, because the dictator does not represent uh, his or, or her society. Still continue to have very few female dictators as something that needs to be changed. But uh, <laughs> uh, a, a dictator does not represent his or her society. And therefore, uh, a democracy has to be careful because the dictator can change in the future. Uh, a democracy is interested in dealing with another society, not with dealing with a, a private clique or clan of people. And we'll have some kinds of economic relationship, but not the same that we have with a democracy where we can be sure that it's representing the interests of the whole society. So uh, again, it would be an argument similar to the argument that uh, companies make when, you know, if a company is dealing with another company and there are doubts whether the CEO of the other company is fully competent to represent the company. Or there have been doubts raised publicly about this. Uh, well, you do due diligence, and perhaps you wait until the internal situation in the other company has been clarified. Well, with a dictator, the same thing. Uh, you don't know if he speaks in the name of the whole society, so we'll wait to see how this is clarified. Perhaps relations between civil society can go on, perhaps relations in the private sector can go on, but we, as, as Germany or as Portugal, as France, we will wait until signing this particular agreement with that particular country because uh, we don't believe that the current government is uh, fully representative uh, of that society. And we uh, uh, are speaking in the name of Germany or Portugal or France. And therefore, we want to talk to uh, a government that represents uh, the country we are, we are trying to reach an agreement with. So there are different arguments that are less based on a kind of moral universalism. I think would be more effective uh, and more powerful, uh, but will get us to the same place or even potentially will get us to a better place than the arguments that are used uh, all the time today. Oh, yeah. yeah, maybe let me ask you a bit sort of a forward looking question. Um, so coming back to your idea of universalism being a Western invention and uh, as you said already, the West is in crisis and hence this whole idea of universalism and, liberalism also is. 
but again, maybe now with COVID, all the states and societies are more in retreat, so we're all more isolated to ourselves. But once the life resumes, uh, we will again interact at a certain level. And the interaction actually has never stopped also on the digital level. So in the uh, you know digital space where we have remained inter uh, interconnected. So the question is if this old model of, you know, a relationship or at least uh, this universal model that was maybe more or less uh, accepted uh, for some time if this is now in retrieve what will come instead of it um, in your article i think you refer to this western universalism model as an operating system so the question would be what what is this new operating system well it looks like it's going to be something like balance of power which we know from history um it is a different kind of balance of power because we we had balance of power in the past that was combined with a certain um regionalism uh, or a certain autarky now we have a balance of power that is combined with globalization and integration uh, so it is different we're not talking about the safavid empire and the ottoman empire the mughal empire the Habsburg empire because they were to a considerable extent isolated from each other but in 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 most basic terms will return to that world where different blocks uh, exist, coexist and, and, and try to balance power. Uh, but perhaps they will be more integrated than in the past. But the principle will probably be the principle of balance of power or equilibrium. Um, and one could make, going back to, to the previous question, uh, how does one uh, think about uh let us call it uh, the problem of china's rise uh, is it the problem that china has a different model from the western model well not necessarily but there is still a problem if china is rising too fast and it's destabilizing uh, one can try to balance chinese power one can try to contain chinese power not in the hope of transforming china into a western democracy but in the hope of creating a world that is more balanced between different centers of power and something like the initiatives that are taking place in the Pacific Quad uh, could be quite effective at doing this, um, particularly as you see that many other countries beside the United States and importantly, countries that have no interest in changing China are concerned with the destabilizing effects and the expansionist nature of contemporary China. So if you look at a country like Japan, uh, I think the difference between the United States and Japan is that Japan is not really interested in changing the Chinese regime and creating a Western democracy there, probably because Japan actually realizes uh, that if that were attempted, um, the destabilizing consequences would be even greater than well, what do we have now. Um, I, I believe that would be the Japanese view. It's obviously not the American view, but still Americans and Japanese are working together because they agree on the point that Chinese power needs to be somehow contained. And they don't have to agree about the nature of the Chinese regime and where the Chinese regime should be going. So I think, you know, to answer your question, I think the organizing principle, rather than being universal liberalism, it is, is going to be something like balance, equilibrium be between different poles. And probably you'll have the dynamic that we had in Europe in the 19th century, but now on a global scale, that when one pole threatens to be to rise too fast, to become destabilizing, the other poles reach some kind of understanding between them, not an alliance, but some kind of understanding to try to balance the power that is rising or the pole that is rising too fast. I agree with the idea that China has risen too fast. If people in Beijing would tell me, who are you to say that? But uh that is risen too fast and and so that some kind of balance and equilibrium has to be reached uh, for the sake of, of of the global order but again not a liberal global order but an order made up of different civilizations of different poles kept in balance when we spoke about china now i spoke about primarily about the, the region china is expansion and, and expansionist and maybe a bit more aggressive. Uh, I want to raise the question on the digital world and uh, the digital freedom. And we see here China trying to influence also that in setting the rules. You know, China is a rule maker. And that, of course, uh, there's a difference between authoritarian systems where you can 
use primarily the digital instruments also for surveillance and so on. And in that direction, it seems that China is exporting technology, but also with some philosophy behind it. So how, how do you see these elements? How should there be a competition or how should we deal with China in this international framework of, for example, also the International Telecommunication Union, where China is trying to get an influence? Um, is it, uh, go, does it go more for coordination, cooperation or more competition? Or should we have also this pragmatic attitude which you just expressed also in the sense of uh, the digital world, because here China is one of the leading uh, nation uh, together with the US and unfortunately Europe is not on number one position. Right, uh, and that's, that's a very big problem actually that Europe is not there. Uh, well, I think there are different issues here. I always like to distinguish when we talk about standards, which are very relevant to the question of new technologies and particular digital technologies. When we talk about standards, there's something we'd call normative standards and something we'd call technological standards. Technological standards are essentially new technologies that can be copyrighted uh, and that uh, as they become universal and perhaps approved by international bodies as uh, uh, international standards, uh, this could be an opportunity that China will use uh, to um, uh, in a way absorb uh, huge sources of revenue that now go to Europe and the United States. Uh, one thing that, that Chinese authorities and Chinese business is very unhappy with is the fact that they don't control technological standards at present. And so if they build a laptop, they will get perhaps two or 3% margin, uh, but uh, the, 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 the bulk of the profit goes to Western companies that hold the copyrights to all the different parts of, of the laptop. The USB port has been copyrighted by European and American companies. And if you want to build a laptop in China, you have to pay royalties, licensing fees. I think this is a very serious problem that business in Germany is very aware of because many of these sources of revenues in royalties and licensing fees are being transferred to China. And many Chinese companies are becoming dominant in the new technologies. 5G, Huawei uh, has already a majority of the patents to the point where even if Huawei is not able to sell it's 5G technology, it's still going to be making a lot of money because those who would be producing and making 5G technology will have to pay royalties and licensing fees to Huawei and other Chinese companies. It's a question of technological standards and the question of normative standards. Uh, how do states relate to the economy? What are the standards of privacy on the internet? Um, banking standards of different kinds uh, and the values that, that they express. That's a different question where I think Western societies are less vulnerable directly. I sometimes hear this idea that you know West, the Chinese normative standards are gonna spread worldwide. Well, obviously it's very difficult to see how they can spread to Europe. Uh, these things don't spread unnoticed and I see very little interest or appetite in Europe in adopting this. If anything, Europe has transformed privacy into a religion so I cannot see how sort of unaware we would adopt Chinese standards. What can happen, and is dangerous, is those middle areas of the world, what used to be called originally the third world, which is not supposed to be developing world, but a world that is not aligned. So there's areas which are going to be important uh, and are in a way undecided between a Chinese model and a Western model. Uh, Chinese normative standards can spread in those areas and that will reduce our markets so, um, and I've been writing quite a bit about this. Uh, if, let us say, uh, and I'm not even thinking specifically about countries in Africa, but if Bosnia-Herzegovina adopts in its government regulations a number of standards having to do with how public bodies can offer credit guarantees to construction companies, for example. If Bosnia adopts these kind of standards, which are common in China, but not common in the EU, we will see that it's going to become very difficult for us to, well, first of all, to do business in Bosnia, second, to even think about integrating Bosnia into the European Union, because it's public, right? Rather than having the traditional, which you know very well, process of enlargement, which is a, a slow, gradual process of alignment, where you go rule by rule, law by law, and change it to 
fit with European standards. I think what's happening in many countries, I give Bosnia as an example, but if you if you go outside Europe even more, there's been a process of enlargement conceived as uh, converging to a Chinese model. Uh, it's not the European kind of process, it's not as bureaucratic and legalistic, but slowly countries in Africa, for example, are changing their laws in order to make them more compatible with the Chinese model. Uh, and this, I think, is also a reason of great concern. So we have the technological standards as a problem and we have normative standards as a problem. Um, and the awareness of, of this is greater now than a few years ago, but perhaps not as great as it deserves to be. Thank you very much. I think uh, it would be good now for Marilia to put the last question for this public part. Anyway, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we look forward to your next books and articles. Marilia. Yes, thank you, Hannes. Thank you, Mr. Masayas. Um, I, I would just uh, ask you a concluding question since you also said that the, the world is going to be more, you know, geopolitical one and more like defined by power play and so on. Uh, so my question would be, what, what, what is the European power in this world? Uh, what is the European civilization? It seems to me actually also reading from your article that Europe tends to equalize rights-based approach with a culture. This is something that, that it defines as a culture, whereas other states might not see it this way. So how would you say will this play out in the future? Right, so I argue in the book, and this is something I will need to develop in the future, that Europe is in a particular predicament, very delicate predicament, because it created this civilization of liberalism and intended it to become universal. If it now is revealed as not being universal, what do we as Europeans do? Do we embrace it as something that is limited to us, that is culturally limited? Do we abandon it? as well as the rest of the world has. And if we abandon it, what do we replace it with? Because India and China have their in indigenous, in some cases, thriving cultural traditions. But we in Europe actually have kind of discarded our older cultural traditions and replaced them with liberalism. I don't believe, for example, in the political project represented by Orban that one could go back to our Christian roots. There's no going back to Christian roots after we uprooted them. So we are in a particular predicament. Um, I suspect we are not going to abandon liberalism, but we're going to transform it in something more limited to ourselves and to Europe uh, and try to provide it some kind of new content. Uh, in terms of power, uh, it is a very ambiguous situation. Um, it's one of those cases where we will have to wait and see. Uh, I'm very curious to know, but it's very difficult to know before it actually takes place, what will happen to Europe in the next 10 years. Uh, the two trends are, on the one hand, a trend of decline, which you can find evidence everywhere if you're interested in building that narrative. Uh, I'll give you one striking example, but this would be a long discussion. Uh, you know, I remember 10 years ago, five years ago, we would talk about how there was instability on the borders of Europe. This you know, was talked all the time in the Foreign Affairs Council and so on. Well, what we meant five, 10 years ago was Syria, Iraq, perhaps Egypt. Now we say there's instability on the borders of Europe and we mean Crete and we mean uh, Brest uh, on the border of uh, Poland and, and Belarus. Uh, so basically now, to be honest, we should say we should say there is now serious instability and threat of armed conflict, not on the borders of Europe, but on this on oh, sorry inside Europe, on the periphery of Europe, no longer on the borders. So I think this is a very striking example that things are not going well, uh, and 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 that we could be reaching a kind of geopolitical crisis of of, of really historical dimensions in Europe. One possibility is that Russia announces. Perhaps this week, some people have suggested the incorporation of Belarus. I think this would be a geopolitical crisis of massive dimension, because if I were a political leader in Poland or Lithuania, I would conclude that my borders have been changed by force. Because the, your borders are not just the line, your borders are who is on the other side. And that now suddenly Poland and Lithuania have a border with mainland Russia, not just Kaliningrad. I think it is their borders have, have changed. And if your borders have changed, there's no more delicate question of national survival than that. 
So I would go to Brussels and say, every normal business now stops until the problem of our borders is solved. So I, I, you know, it is conceivable that within weeks, the Europe could be submerged in, in, in a massive geopolitical crisis. So that's the negative narrative. And it'd be very easy to write a book developing it. I haven't done it because I'm not sure. I see also positive signs. There has been a certain awakening. If you read the documents from the last year, no one reads them, but if you read the documents on strategic autonomy, on access to raw materials, on the new trade policy strategy, this is a new EU, more aware of power competition. So we'll have to wait and see whether this, this can happen. I, I remain convinced, you know, Luke van Middeler, very interesting, exciting uh, author writing about Europe. He says that the geopolitical awakening has already happened with Brexit, with Trump, with Turkey. I don't see that at all. I don't even know how someone can argue that. I'm, I remain convinced that there may be a geopolitical awakening, but I, I remain convinced it will happen after a very serious geopolitical crisis and that there's no way to happen before that. So, you know, in a way I've been waiting for that crisis, not, not waiting in the sense of desiring it, but I think that's gonna be the decisive moment for Europe when we have a serious, more serious than Ukraine geopolitical crisis. And that's when the moment to see whether we enter an inevitable path of decline and perhaps a chaotic path of decline or whether that is that geopolitical awakening. But the geopolitical awakening is the, the most important question in Europe today. And I guess there's a debate between those who would say we don't need it, those who would say it's already happened, those who would say it will happen, and those like myself who would say it will happen in a very delicate moment of emergency or crisis. And it may be coming. Is it an optimistic or a pessimistic answer? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it is both, yeah? I guess it is both at the same time. Thank you very much for this uh, public event and discussion we had. It was a great pleasure, Mrs. Svoboda. <laughs>